and leave behind a country that can sustain itself and pose little threat to U.S. national security interests, the overall picture is bleak. Why? What explains how so much energy, effort, blood, and treasure yielded so little? The report lists many reasons. Incoherent strategy, lack of patience, unrealistic expectations, insufficient monitoring, all of which shine a light on specific failures. One of the report's conclusions, for example, is that U.S. goals were often contradictory. It pumped billions of dollars into the economy while at the same time trying to end corruption. It wanted to weaken warlords and militias, yet would also rely on them when it wanted to establish security quickly. It wanted to end opium production, but not take away farmers' incomes. But these do not feel like they get at the core of the problem. After their defeat in 2001, the Taliban regrouped and steadily gained ground from approximately 2005 onwards. The report documents that enemy-initiated attacks rose from about 2,300 in 2005 to almost 23,000 in 2009 and never dropped below 21,000 since then, despite various changes in U.S. strategies and tactics and troop levels. A civilian advisor to the military on Iraq and Afghanistan, Carter Malkasian, wrote a book, which I believe comes closest to providing an overarching explanation. The Taliban exemplified something that inspired, something that made them powerful in battle, something closely tied to what it meant to be Afghan, he wrote. In simple terms, they fought for Islam and resistance to occupation, values enshrined in Afghan identity, Aligned with foreign occupiers, the government mustered no similar inspiration. America was the outsider in the middle of a complex civil war in Afghanistan, and the new Afghan government was never able to gain the legitimacy it needed. It was seen as massively corrupt and utterly reliant on America, and both charges were true. When a government has internal legitimacy, think of Ukraine today, Foreigners can help it effectively. But when it lacks internal strength and support, outside help often weakens its credibility. To that, one can add all kinds of other important reasons. The Taliban had sanctuary in Pakistan. Historically, it has been virtually impossible to defeat a well-armed insurgency that has a safe haven in a neighboring country. Americans don't understand foreign countries and cultures. The Iraq war was a massive distraction. U.S. agencies sometimes worked at cross purposes with one another, and so on. But there is another important lesson for America. The danger of not looking at reality carefully and succumbing to groupthink. For a long time, Washington's elites saw Afghanistan as the good war, morally justified, sanctioned by the United Nations. People were invested in believing that it was working and many blinded themselves to evidence that it wasn't. The military is often very clear-eyed about a conflict, but once given a task, it will provide a stream of reports that prove it is succeeding. In Vietnam, it was body counts of the enemy dead. In Afghanistan, it was the growing numbers of the Afghan National Army, which turned out to be massively inflated. For all the flaws in the withdrawal, Joe Biden was one of the people who was willing to ask uncomfortable questions and to look beyond the happy talk. In an intelligent essay in The Atlantic, General David Petraeus takes stock of the war and argues that America's foundational mistake in Afghanistan was a lack of commitment. He is surely right at one level. There was clearly an ebb and flow in America's support. But it is worth noting that America stayed fighting in Afghanistan longer than the British did in all three Anglo-Afghan wars combined. It stayed twice as long as the Soviet Union did in the late 70s and 80s. In Elliot Ackerman's new book, The Fifth Act, America's End in Afghanistan, he notes that everything America built in Afghanistan was made of plywood, a metaphor for our hesitation about the mission. Contrast that with the British, who would arrive in a country and quickly built stone monuments 
to symbolize their enduring empire. Well, I suspect that America will always be ambivalent, will always be the plywood imperialist.